I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Rachel Joyce is one of our very favorite writers. She has been on our radar since 2012 when the unlikely pilgrimage of Harold Fry came out and we chose it for the Barnes & Noble Discover program. And that was followed by the love song of Miss Queenie Hennessy. And now we have a third Harold Fry novel with Maureen. And Rachel, it's so lovely to see you. Thank you so much for making the time. Let's set up Maureen for listeners, though, who may not necessarily remember exactly who she is. Uh, yes, of course. Well, just to say, I mean, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, but Maureen is the wife of Harold Fry. And Harold Fry is the man. In fact, 10 years ago, uh, the book first first came out. Uh, 10 years ago, Harold um, walked to a, a friend who was dying, uh, a walk that took him the whole length of England, which is quite a considerable walk in the hope that it would save her. And his wife, Maureen, was left behind. And she, too, went on a kind of journey, but it was very much a journey within the confines of her home. She is Harold's long suffering wife uh, with quite a sharp tongue. This book picks them up 10 years after that walk. And Harold, this is a new Harold. He's very mellow, this Harold that we meet in this book. This, this, the Harold that we meet now is at peace. The Harold of the unlikely pilgrimage of Harold Fry was a man who was not at peace. I mean, had not even addressed, really, the source of his guilt. They had this kind of terrible unspoken secret between them, which meant that they could not talk to one another. And his whole journey is about not just connecting with the land, but reconnecting with himself and his loss. Well, now he is, he is having done that walk, you know, he's a, he's a more tired man, but he's a content man. His journey is done. And you've always described Harold Fry and Queenie Hennessy. I have this habit of shortening titles, but um, Harold Fry and Queenie Hennessy, more as companion volumes. They're not sequel and prequel. They're not, they're just two pieces of a bigger story. Yeah. So do we consider Maureen... A technical sequel? I just sort of feel like it's another companion volume because... I think she maybe is a companion, but maybe okay. a little behind or ahead, depending on where we place ourselves in time. Because as I was doing my research for the show too, I learned that a reader had come up to you while you were promoting Harold Fry and said, you know, this is a triptych, right? Yeah. So can we talk about that for a second? Because originally you'd set out just to write Harold. Yes, and it was my first novel. And as many are when they first th write their first novels I was overjoyed that I had made it to the you know made it to the end and that it had been published you know that for me was the end of the journey and then I started doing publicity for Harold and it was very early on that a, a reader said to me as as you said you know this is a, she said you know this is a triptych and I I, I remember thinking Oh no! Come on! Because I, I <laughs> just got to, I got to the end of the first one. I thought, what do you want from me? But I also knew that she was right, as readers often are. Actually, they sniff. You know, they can sniff something. And it wasn't that um, the world of Harold Fry, the first book, isn't complete. It is completely what it's set out to be. But there was definitely room around. There was a seep. The kind of seeping out from it that that allowed two more books and I always think so long as they are they are showing you new territory you're not going over anything old you're actually adding to the story and you're deepening the story then it's very kind of valuable and rich well and I definitely have a new view of Maureen after the new book without a doubt there is a lot I, there are some moments where readers will absolutely recognize this, Maureen. You're like, oh, <laughs> you're in the war. Oh, okay. And I'm not going to spoil it for people because there are a couple of very funny moments where you're just like, she is fully unprepared, fully <laughs> unprepared to be out in the world. And yet yeah. her story arc is really satisfying. She has, Maureen has adventures, which, you know, when we first encounter her in Harold Fry, Maureen's not interested in adventures. She just wants everything to be better but not yeah. different, no, which is exactly. a weird exactly. place to be. Yes, yes. I think gr her grief, though, and her loss, her sense mm -hmm. of loss, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk about that, but has almost put her in a safe place. You know so how sometimes you can become safe with loss if you don't push the boundaries? So she's not pushing any boundaries, and she, she stays at home. She's very, very organized about her home. 
and she's very clean about her home. There is not one speck of her home that is not polished and, you know, kind of zipped and zapped. But she's not been out into the world. And what Harold does in that first book is go out. And Queenie in the second book, even though she is actually in one place, also travels outwards, really travels in her imagination. But Maureen has never made that leap with into kind of into the unknown. She just hasn't put her foot onto the ice. And so that was why I felt that there was a place for this book, was for, to allow this woman that journey that might finally give her some kind of peace, really, you know, kind of, and self-forgiveness and, you know, just the kind of joy of connecting. Yeah, and that's one of the things that Maureen doesn't realize she's missing. She doesn't quite know that she's lonely. She knows yeah. that she's had a significant loss and that she's allowed it to define her. Yeah. But she doesn't know she's lonely. She doesn't know that she needs other people. And Harold sort of falls into that. I mean, yeah, she's married to him. But at the same time, she's kind of like, well, I don't really need you, but you're my husband and we share this thing. And she really is kind of very tightly wound into her own little world. Yeah, she is. It's a kind of cocoon, you know, or a spider's web of her own kind of creation as they are. I mean, it lacks wonder, which is the thing that Harold discovers and Queenie discovers. And Maureen has just cut that out for herself. And the thing that I appreciate about your novels, too, we were talking about this a little bit before we hit record, is the fact that they're just not treacly. <laughs> they're not. They're very, I mean, the pretense of Harold, of course, walking 600 something miles end to end in England and hoping that, you know, Queenie wouldn't die. Um yeah. They're just not treacly. And Maureen, again, I know I've mentioned that she's prickly. She's yes. very, very prickly. But ultimately, you do write hopeful novels about our ability to change. Yes. We just have to put a little bit of work into it. <laughs> yes. I mean, I often think that I take my characters um, at the beginning of a story and they're in a place where they are in a kind of place of status you know like the kingdom is asleep or you know they're kind of in a place where the world isn't really quite as they would like it but they can't really summon up the energy or the imagination right. or the willpower to change and then I come along and it's like you know, <laughs> if I go come on we are there you are going to change now and you know in credit to them they do all take it on board they do but I do feel sometimes as a writer, you're a bit like a therapist, you know, and you're you're kind of aiding your characters to see the things about themselves that are holding them back. You know, those unconscious choices or, or things that they've inherited, that baggage. So you're not saying that the world is always going to be rosy and beautiful after this, but just that they might be better equipped to deal with it. So here we are 10 years after Harold Fry, which was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Prize, longlisted for the Man Booker, sold kajillions of copies around the world. And in fact, I think we're at over 5 million copies worldwide in 36 languages, something like that. I it mean, might be, but yes, I, I'm very bad with numbers. So okay. as a child, I, if I, when I had to do maths, people always said, can you add this up? And I would just say, yeah, there's lots. There's lots. <laughs> okay. It's a good thing you stick with words. There's lots. <laughs> But Harold Fry really had this massive moment. And, you know, time has gotten very slippery, I think, for all of us. And 10 years ago feels like, you know, sometimes it may as well be longer than that kind of thing. But here yeah. you are 10 years in this world of these lovely, prickly, interesting people. Yeah. Do you miss it now that Maureen is on the page? Yeah, I I do and I don't. I mean, okay. I think I, I I it was a book I knew that I had to write, mm -hmm. but I found very very hard to write, and it's partly because not because she's a prickly character, because actually mm -hmm. personally I really like prickly characters, and I really like people who say the wrong thing. I'm you know I find them endearing, and also you know she's got some spine, and I really like that about her. Kind of writing how she let go of grief was such a personal journey for me too. It took me a very, very long time to see that I was ready to say goodbye to my own grief because the whole sort of trilogy came about really when um, my father told us he was dying. And um, 
you know, the book was really my way of dealing with that grief. Not that I really completely understood it at the time, because you often don't, I think. But it was about the, it, but it is a journey of, of grief, I think, if you kind of actually kind of split it down, you know, the kind of anger and the bargaining and the denial. They're all there. And those were things I really, really felt. Um, but it's now, I mean, it's 10 years since the book came out. It's longer since my father died. And it really was only after lockdown when um, I think a lot of people found that we kind of really reconnected with the past. And I certainly thought a lot about the past. I thought a lot about my dad and I thought a lot about Maureen. And so it was kind of as a result of lockdown and coming through lockdown, also writing the screenplay for the film. I finally realized how to write Maureen, you know, and how what her journey had to be. And also she and and she sort of came back to me again, I think, as a result, really, of all of all those things happening. You started out there writing radio plays, right? Yeah, I did. I okay. Did. So dialogue, because dialogue obviously is <laughs> it's a treat oh, in all of dialogue. your books. Yeah. And I mean, I think some of that comes out of writing radio scripts, yeah? I mean, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, because uh, you know, in radio, the scene is the dialogue. That you know, that is where it all happens. And what I love about dialogue is that people often don't say the thing they want or need to say, and that is so rich for me. And you know, that's where conflict lies. And also, normally, a conversation is two people who don't agree. So there's so much richness there, and you can learn so much about a character from what they say, as opposed to me telling you. So it's just very, very rich. And I feel very lucky that I've had that kind of discipline, really, of writing for radio all those years. So then stripping down the novel, Harold Fry, for the film, and Jim Broadbent's in the film, right? Yes, Jim Broadbent plays Harold, and Penelope Wilton is Maureen. Okay, what great cast, and that is such great yeah. casting. So stripping your own novel down to the studs, as it were, I mean, obviously yeah. a, a film script is what, 60 pages, 120 pages? I can't remember yeah, what the exact... 100 pages. Yeah. Okay. So you've got to take out so much. How do you decide what stays and what goes? It's a curious, I mean, I'm lucky because I've done so much for radio. I actually adopted other people, adapted other people's novels often for radio. So I knew a little, I mean, not that that makes you brilliant at doing your own, but it, I'm lucky in that I don't feel precious. I never feel precious about my own work. I'm very happy to cut or like, like too happy to cut sometimes. Uh, so it's a question, really, of taking the essence of the story and thinking, right, what worked as a book? How do we lift that now into the medium of film? And what is necessary from the book that, you know, what, how? And the main, main challenge for me was in the book, we are so much part of Harold's thinking. As in Maureen, we are right in Maureen's head. How do you get that for a cinema audience that you get them? That so that they can see without us obviously having a kind of voiceover, which I really, really didn't want, how this man is thinking and feeling. And also so much of the books are about flashback, about memory. So how can you kind of bring that to the film without great chunky bits of exposition? That's so great. Now that all three books are sort of in the world mm. and you've built sort of, I don't want to call it a series because they they really can stand alone. But at the same time, yeah. it is a really fun reading experience if you have all three sort of under your belt. But was there anything that really surprised you book to book? Or do you have a favorite moment that you sort of carried over between the three? I think it was more kind of thinking, right, OK, what are the keys? Where are the clues in this right. book as to what right. needs to happen? You know, you have a sense of what needs to happen. But as I said, I I spent a lot of time trying to write Maureen and I actually had four goes. And oh. you know, I mean, I don't just mean I wrote the beginning. I mean, right. I wrote the whole thing. Right. OK. And then got to the end and went, no, 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 I don't believe this. this. This does not work. This isn't true to the voice. This is just not what I'm looking for. So then you kind of, I knew that Maureen had to go on a journey. I wasn't sure where even. So you think it is staring at me in the face. Why can I not see it? Mm -hmm. And then I knew that there were some key meetings that she needed to make. And I knew that the people she needed to meet were in the book already. I knew they were. But could I see them? No, I could not. 
And then you do think them and you see them and you think, but of course, that's just right. so obvious. There's one in particular that we're just going to let readers cross paths with, but um, I had to yeah. laugh. I, I absolutely laughed. It, it was someone who sent a postcard to Harold and yes. just the way this person lives and Maureen being Maureen. Yes, yes. <laughs> it was great. It was really, I could just see Maureen's face when she landed. <laughs> when she meets the <laughs> I mean, the satisfaction for me is always when you take a character and you think, hmm, who would this character least like to meet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you've got the clues. You know the basic yeah. beats of what you're doing, but you're not really sitting down with an outline. I mean, if you did four drafts of Maureen. Yeah, no. I mean, people always say to me, do you outline? And I always say, yeah, I write the outline when I've written the book. That's oh, when I see what the outline is. I always know where I'm going. I always know and pretty early on. I know what the end of the book is, because for me, the beginning and the end are so related. You know, but they're like across the world from one another, but they are related. But I never know how I'm going to get there. And and that is just a process of trying things and realizing I don't believe them and then trying another route. So as much as I would love to plan, I can't. But that that sort of does it sound true? Does it sound right? That really is your measure of whether or not a scene is working. It is. Do I believe this? Yeah. It's also to do with something that is very difficult to define, but I think about it increasingly, which is the voice of the book. Yeah. You know, not, not, I don't even just mean, you know, the words that you choose, but the tone, it's the kind of, it's the wit, it's the energy of the book. It's a very, and, and each book is different. It has its, it has its, you know, different quality. And you, I don't think you can pre-decide that. It, it happens okay. as you write the book. And you, again, when you hit it, you go, yeah, yeah, yes, this is it. This is what the thing was that I could sniff and smell and sense but I, you know, couldn't get my hands around. Uh, and for me, it just takes a lot of tries. Did you do Harold Fry then in multiple drafts as well, the way you did? Harold with Fry was much simpler in a sense because I had written it once as a radio play. I mean, a very different beast. But I knew already the kind of the starting point, the end point, and I knew what I would call this key structural scenes. And so, and also I knew the characters very, very well because I'd had the experience of them being a radio play. You know, I, I so I knew a lot. Um, strangely, there was the kind of one key point I really, really didn't know. Uh, but that's part of the delight, isn't it, of being creative is that it surprises you. I'm so happy to know you get surprised by these things too, because I mean, honestly, it all feels so organic. I never would have known that Maureen had been through four drafts before what I read on the page it's just sort of like well here I am I'm telling you a story <laughs> I think that's hopefully because when you arrive at the draft that is right it actually it rings truthfully you know like it just it, it has the right timbre the right song the right whatever it is however you want to describe it and again Maureen you know she has her moments where she's really prickly but at the same time she gets this very nice story arc there's some very interesting connections that she makes. Yeah. And ultimately, she gets a little bit of peace, which I don't think Maureen was ever expecting to have. I don't think Maureen was yeah. ever looking for peace. She was so settled yeah. in who she is and how she sees the world. And now yeah. she's got Harold sitting there very quietly, you know, blissfully almost. Yeah. And she really does not know what to do with herself. It's kind yeah. of fascinating to see. Yeah, yes. I, I think you're right. I think of, of 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 all three characters, Harold, Queenie, Maureen. Maureen is the one who is least equipped, prepared, and wanting to change or make a journey or you know, or or to find a kind of relationship with the natural world, actually. The fact that Harold by this book is happily bird watching, I mean, is kind of just anathema to her. She does not understand why somebody would want to look at birds, apart from the fact that it seems to keep him happy. But, but you know, for her, that is, it, it just doesn't make sense. But her journey does allow her, and, and it's a winter journey too. You know, it's a, it's a tougher journey. And traditionally, winter journeys, unlike Harold's spring journey, where everything is awakening, 
Maureen's journey is about going to the dark. And it's when you go right into the dark, you then find the light and the kind of renewal. And, and of all of them, this book felt to me a book about rebirth, which felt the right place to end. I want to step away from Harold Fry for just a second. And I'd love to talk to you about Miss Benson's Beetle, because this was one of our paperback monthly picks for fiction back in 21, which complicated year for a lot of people. It's, we're in 2023 now, and I'm having a moment of, I'm sorry, what is that number? At the end? <laughs> How, what? My sense of time, as I had mentioned earlier, has been a little slippery. Yeah. But Miss Benson's Beetle, if you haven't had a chance to pick it up, and I, I cannot say enough that you really should because it's fun it's a story of friendship and discovery and bugs <laughs> bugs <laughs> it has a great opening line it's really wonderful this book and can we just talk about the creation of miss benson's beetle you can see sort of how you operate in the world but it is a different book from the Harold Fry novels in a lot of ways. So can we just talk about how that came about? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a wonderful book to write for me. It was a joyful book and a liberating book to write. And it was partly because uh, halfway through writing um, a previous book, I suddenly thought, why as a woman am I not putting women at the center of my fiction? What am I doing? It felt such a grave mistake. So. Or all kind of you know, just an omission, and uh, I thought, what am I doing to myself that I'm not writing this book? Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, the next book I thought, right, all women. It's going to be all women. So I set off thinking I'm going to write a book that celebrates a friendship, an unlikely friendship, that word, between two women. Uh, but there are so many books that do it really brilliantly. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to take the boy's own adventure story. Yeah, genre, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hijack it for women. So I read so many boys' own adventure stories in which you, I mean, it's its shocking how few women there are in them, except at home. But there's always a dog. I thought there was always a dog. I did just unashamedly take the genre. And this is an adventure story for women. And I'm very proud that it's an adventure story for women. But what I had thought originally was that this is what I mean about the tone of a book, that it was going to be a very quiet, gentle book, very short, about two women going to the other side of the world right. to look for a beetle. Why I thought that would be quiet, I can't imagine. But anyway, <laughs> in that it was. But what I hadn't accounted for was just when I put two women together who were such opposites, because mm -hmm. they are, one is an introvert, mm -hmm. really set in her ways. The other is the wildest extrovert ever. And really, you know, again, two women who would not be together right. if they could help it. But when I did put them together and when they started being open to one another, it was kind of this explosive, kind of slightly bonkers energy. <laughs> and I just thought, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll go with this then. I'll see where this energy takes me. And it was, I mean, it was so strange, really, that it coincided with lockdown. I mean, in, in the You're UK, right. it completely hit. Every lockdown we had, it, it, it kind of, Miss Benson's Beetle fell in it. So when it was a kind of, when it was a proof copy, it fell into a lockdown. When it was a hardback, it fell into the next new one. As a paperback, it fell into the next new one. It just kept on hitting them. And yet it was a book that is so kind of, you know, not contained and not about staying at home, but about, you know, pushing yourself to the other end of the world for these two women. But kind of it's about vocation and working together and trusting kind of another woman, really, to show you the parts of yourself that you've you've cut off. And uh, yeah, it was a joy to write. Mm -hmm. And it's really a joy to read, too. <laughs> But can we talk about the photo that sort of inspired yes. the idea? Because yes. I love yes. this story. This is a great well, story. <laughs> it's, I mean, as with most things, when you're writing, you're always looking for little signs, you know, that you're doing the right thing. And very early on when I was writing this, I had started to find these two women. And um, I was at a museum showing a friend um, uh, about an artist and uh, we found this photograph of this artist, uh, May Morris. So she's um, Mor William Morris's daughter. And she was a sort of great artist, but also a kind of big political thinker. 
Mm-hmm. It's a photograph of her with her friend, her companion. Mm-hmm. Right. And her companion was actually the gardener, uh, mm-hmm. another woman. But what I loved about this photograph is that the two women are standing together. The woman who's the gardener, who is apparently quite foul-mouthed and drank a lot of cider, <laughs> is looking straight at the camera. She's got her hands on her hips. She's dressed in men's clothing. And May, the kind of thinker and the artist, is standing at her side, but staring off past the camera. And I just thought, how brilliant that these two women are caught at that position where they are enabling one another to be the women that they are. And possibly without, you know, without the other other woman beside her, they wouldn't be able to be who they truly are. But again, it's, I mean, I I have it above my desk because I find it such a beautiful photograph, such a strong photograph and such an inspiring photograph. Mm -hmm. I love that story. I really do. Why do you write? What do you get from writing novels that you don't get from writing radio plays? Uh, Well, from, I began to discover with writing radio plays that actually the world was a little too small. I wanted more than dialogue. I wanted to be able to go into people's heads. And in fact, the clue was that I started writing radio plays with way too much voiceover. And if you're writing voiceover, it means that you're actually trying to do something different. And also, as much as I try to use sound to create pictures, I think in a very, very visual way. And I wanted to be able to describe what I was seeing. But the other reason I write is that I think I basically have to. I it's how I make sense of things. When I reflect on things, I think I see them more clearly. And Mm -hmm. if I just speak about them, I tend not to engage in them in the kind of full way that I want to. Do you have a favorite moment from Harold Fry or Queenie Hennessy or Maureen that really, that you sort of carry around with you that you think, oh yeah, this is just, this is it. Um, I don't know whether, I don't know. I mean, I'm a bit loath to really, because I sort of think, I think I'm quite self-critical, so Uh, I I accept that that is part of being creative. But there, I mean, I find now uh, it's easier to look back at Harold. I'm not quite there with Maureen yet, but to Mm -hmm. look at Harold and go, well, that's a quite good passage. (laughs) Because it's not familiar to me anymore. Whereas Maureen, I'm still so in the pages, you know, I'm in, I know exactly how I found it. I can see my little head working, but Harold is becoming unfamiliar to me as, as other books are. And so, you know, sometimes because if you are a critical person, you know, you are just so aware of all the things you aren't getting right. It is rather wonderful if you can look at them sometimes and think, oh, actually, do you know what? As far as the person I, the person I am, that captured what I wanted to say. Can we, for a second, talk about some of the writers who've made you Rachel Joyce novelist? Who are some of your favorites? Who are some of the writers that you think, oh, yeah, this is, this made me think in a different way? Yeah, I I have so many. I mean, I'm a very big reader and I'm a very open reader. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm Mm -hmm. very willing to be transported. Having said that, I mean, as a child or as a young woman, I read a lot of the class. I I was very much in a kind of, the Brontes, Jane Austen, mm-hmm. George Eliot, Hardy. So I was very kind. Of, I I really was immersed in those worlds, and mm-hmm. especially someone like the Hardy or Charlotte Bronte, actually in particular, her relationship and her writing about nature is I mm-hmm. find very very powerful. But going on from there, I mean, now I'm I will pick up I will pick up anything. I'd say Jean Rhys when I was a young woman. Oh, absolutely. I discovered Catherine Mansfield as a mm-hmm. young woman. Again, I didn't know that you could write short stories until I read Catherine Mansfield. And yeah, with yeah. that, you know, that sharp, sharp, witty eye. And from there, I would say Alice Munro, uh, Anne Tyler, uh, Elizabeth Strout. I mean, there, there are so many now. Um, Anne Patchett, so many that I would... Very voicey, voicey writers. You, I mean, it all comes down to voice for all of them, which I think is pretty great. I'm, (laughs) I would read all of them in a minute. Yes. (laughs) You know, we're taping this right after the start of the new year, and this is sort of our re entry point. But you have this lovely, lovely thing that you and your husband do at the new year, which is you invite friends over and you ask them all to bring a piece of music. 
And you all yeah. listen together and talk about the music, which I think is a lovely tradition. But can I ask what you've been listening to lately? Oh, but you know what? I'm terrible because over Christmas, mm -hmm. all I want to listen to is Christmas carols. I'm, I'm just, you know. Fair I'm, enough. <laughs> I, but I, I'm sort of like, you know, by, by November, my husband is going, you're not listening to Christmas carols, are you? I'm <laughs> not listening to medieval Christmas carols in the hope that he won't realize what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> But I do. And then and then as it progresses, so by Christmas Day, I'm on O Come All Ye Faithful, you know, and I mean, not even a kind of religious person. But I think there's something about anthem and that celebration that I find very moving. Having said that, only today I was listening to a piece on the radio about Ness and Dorma, the um, Puccini, and just somebody talking about that aria. Right. right. And I thought, God, that has the that, that has such power to move me, and I I think increasingly what I love when I listen to is music that just gets me in the gut because I think it does at its best. What words, I you know, you, it's very difficult to do with a book. It just goes straight in there. It's like goes into the blood, into the heart, and. Um, takes you to a kind of quite I mean it can take you to just a place where I feel so emotional and so moved right. I think by the beauty of the human voice in the case of um Ness and Dorma you know just those those leaps those octave leaps that the voice can make and you think my god human beings at their best are really got something you know at their best and that moves me do you listen to music as you write or do you need quiet yeah. as you write? No, I do listen to music and I love listening to music as I write, but I tend to listen to quite quiet, folky music so that, I mean, I can't listen to anything that interrupts me, but I think it's more like companionship, really. What's next? I'm always working on something. I've always got, I'm always being chased by something rather. I'm also, I'm crazily, I'm actually working on a musical which I've never wait, done. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, I'm not writing the music, you'll be pleased to hear, but I'm writing the kind of script. And um, uh, and that is for, for Harold Fry again. So, um, so they've not completely gone. They're just singing now. I can see, yeah, but I can see Harold yeah. Fry working as, yeah. I, I can absolutely, yeah, that makes perfect uh, sense I mean, to me. So many books now are being adapted for stage, so it's interesting. But I have a new book on the go because I always have a book on the go. And the new is what really pulls me because I haven't found it yet, you know. And so I'm at that sort of tantalizing place where you're just, I'm thinking about it all the time and, be, and I'm like a sieve. Everything that happens is going through this sieve of just, is this relevant to the book? You know, if my characters wore the hat that that woman over there is wearing, would that alter things? You know, it's sort of everything is in that. Point. So when you start a new book, are you talking about the, are you working off of an idea first or are you working off of a voice first? I say it's character. It's characters. It always characters, always start with the characters. And I just see what comes. And I don't, I, I, I don't judge it. I, I just write whatever, whatever comes. And then I start to look at it and think, well, that's not a book. That doesn't hang together. But who have I got here? You know, and, and what is the voice? And then I start trying to sort of string it together and imposing some kind of, finding some kind of structure or, you know, to kind of keep the reader going with it. Mm -hmm. I will say the narrative tension, you do a really great job of making sure that the story is always moving forward, that we're not just sitting in a moment and wondering what's going to happen next. It's just this constant. And again, I do think that comes a little bit from writing radio plays because you've just got to know how to keep things moving forward. You, I think it becomes part of how you, you, t you tell mm -hmm. stories because in, in radio drama, as you say, it is so easy for a person to turn it off. It is so you your job as the writer is to not just to entertain, but to intrigue, to enchant, to coax, to delight, to frighten, whatever it is, but to there's a brilliant bit in um the end of As You Like It when um Rosalind is talking to the audience and she's trying to get them to applause and she says, My way is to conjure you. And I think conjuring is such a great word for the writer, you know, that 
that's what the story is. I'm going to conjure something. Mm -hmm. And it's not just science fiction and fantasy. I mean, you have to build this world yeah. that Harold yeah. and Queenie and Maureen live in. I mean, yes. this is, yeah, there's a little bit of magic that happens in this book. I, I hope so, yes. Before I let you go, though, is there anything we missed about Maureen? I mean, obviously, we're dancing around plot points and we're dancing around how the story unfolds because there's so much fun to discover in this book. But yeah, is there something you want listeners to know that we haven't touched on? Ah, I mean, I think the only thing about it is that one of the reasons I feel it was it has earned its place was that it does shine a light on Harold Fry and it does shine a light on Queenie. I mean, years ago, Susan Camel, who we talked about earlier, said to me, uh, and she, I know, I, she, such an extraordinary woman and such, I mean, I haven't met anyone who could kind of wind her way through a book like she could, but said, does Harold really never have a sense of what Queenie feels? <laughs> and I thought that was such a sharp, good question. And I'd sort of slightly, you know, stepped round that. And I feel that really Maureen addresses that. Yes. I think this yes. is me saying to Susan, yes, you're right. And this is this is my answer, Susan. Uh, that makes me really happy to hear. Um, I miss her. I miss her every single day. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I am so happy that Maureen is out in the world and I cannot wait for readers to pick it up and figure out all of these missing pieces that you and I have been talking around because the, it's, you know, it's the journey. There's a reason we say it's all about the journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rachel, thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Hello readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Maureen. I'm Mark, I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble store in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm joined by my book buddy Jamie. Hello! Hi Mark, I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble store in Leewood, Kansas. Hoorah! Well, we've got a couple of great books to talk about. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. I chose a title that is um, oozing with charm. Uh, this is Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. This book is in conversation a lot in general, but I, I couldn't not bring it up. Um, I think it's just a charming book about a woman who is trying to connect to the world around her. And it reminded me a bit of Rachel Joyce's character. We're following the title character, Eleanor. Uh, she is probably one of the most literal-minded characters I've read in a long time. She is nearing 30. She struggles with social norms. She says exactly what is on her mind for good or for ill. She avoids contact and she is very, very comfortable with routines and being alone. I think anybody can connect with at least one or two of those aspects of Eleanor's personality. So when the title comes up, she's completely fine. Yeah, she kind of is. She's fine. She's got her set. She's set up fine. But maybe she wants a little bit more, or maybe, if not more, maybe different. Um, and there's nothing wrong with trying. She is wanting to venture a little outside of her calibrated routine and wants to understand that that can be okay for her, uh, but is having some struggles dealing with that understanding. But maybe that's going to be okay. Maybe it's okay to jump outside of your zone. Maybe it's okay to think a little bit about some pieces of your past that you maybe have shelved and let get covered in dust or tucked away and locked up in a box. But a chance encounter with a pretty charming character uh, spurs Eleanor on a journey to make some changes. And I think readers will delight in the way that she navigates these waters and get some heartstrings pulled by the ways that she confronts some pieces of her past that she has not thought about at all. She's just an interesting character. She's somebody who I would certainly love to hang out with, but I know she wouldn't want to hang out with any of us. So check out Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. Jamie, what do you have for us? This one is an Arthur Pepper. So the Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper by Phaedra Patrick. 
uh, is the book I'm recommending. Um, Arthur is um, a little like uh, Eleanor Oliphant, right? He's he does everything his way. He does it the same always. He is very in control of his situation from day to day. Uh, he's been widowed for a year. He's so stubborn. He's so set in his ways. He seems like he's never going to change. But at, after a year uh, of grieving, he decides that it's time to donate his wife's things. And so as he's going through her clothes and deciding um, to donate them, he finds this beautiful charm bracelet. And he doesn't recognize it. He doesn't know where it came from. He didn't give it to her. It has all of these charms on it. He doesn't know. But it, uh, like Maureen, it kind of unlocks something in his heart. And it sets him on this path where he has to get out of his routine, has to leave the comfort and security of his home and kind of face his grief um, on the road. While he is traveling and taken to all of these far-flung places, you know, from London to Paris to India to figure out where his wife got each of the charms, he also has to face his marriage and kind of the things that he might have done that he's not proud of or the ways that he may have contributed to any distance between them. He's really on this kind of epic hero's journey sort of quest, right? Part of that journey is learning about yourself and figuring out something about yourself at the end, which Arthur Pepper, just like Maureen, um, Arthur Pepper does. So there are kind of like a handful of these sort of, um, I call them like the elderly curmudgeon <laughs> set out on a late life adventure kind of books, um, but they're there for a reason. They work. Uh, there's just certain kind of, of books that hit beats like that, and, and they work. They're charming, um, and this one is a particularly charming example. Um, and like Maureen, it's really about how we can live with a grief that seems impossible um, otherwise. So pick up uh, The Curious Charms of Arthur Pepper by Phaedra Patrick. Such a great book. That's such a good pick. And you're right, there is that theme of grump meets feelings uh, that just works because we all have things that we're dealing with. We all have stuff and baggage and pasts and we deal with them in very different ways. So to connect to somebody like Maureen or like somebody like Arthur or Eleanor, it makes sense because it's a way for us to maybe confront some of the things that we're dealing with ourselves. So nice choices. Well, that's all we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Poured Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Jamie. You can follow my home store at BN Leewood KS. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Bye, Mark. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.